where a small number of rich and powerful individuals are able to capture the news media and prevent a wide range of opinions being formed, prevent major stories about political corruption or incompetence ever getting out. Democracy is seriously threatened. That's something the no free government today would go into stand to prevent. I'm going to bring you two things in my speech. Firstly, why media monopolies and oligopolies distort and prevent the ability to challenge both media corporations and the political and corporate interests that they support, why that's incredibly harmful for our democracy. Secondly, I'm going to explain why high barriers to entry in the news media sector require this kind of intervention. Um, in terms of a model, very briefly, we think it's fairly obvious. Holding corporations are not going to be allowed to hold more than one newspaper or TV channel, whatever it is, across different sectors. In terms of who will regulate that, it will be like the FCC in the United States, Ofcom in the United Kingdom, whoever the regulatory body is. We're going to force them to divest pretty much immediately the assets that they currently hold. Jack. And um, presumably that applies to any kind of Uh, no, ones that like do news, like you can only cartoon network and also sky, but if you're doing news then that's the one that's problematic. So, first, why does this distort the ability to challenge and critique media corporations and the political interests that they represent? Firstly, no thanks to why do these organisations represent clear social interests, why is that damaging? There's an obvious like class point to be made, it's just a base here, but like if you look at News Corp, its two largest shareholders are Rupert Murdoch, the very wealthy Saudi Arabian prince, they represent clear social interests. But more than that, often you get distinct ideological preferences representing distinct, just like random individual preferences. Silvio Berlusconi didn't actually represent the Jews capitalists, he just used his ownership of that news channel to entrench his own political power. Moreover, because it, like, it, um, stock holdings in these corporations are often uh, like rich hedge funds or so on that own lots of other corporations, what you get is powerful corporations across different sectors all being represented by one news media organisation. The other reason that this is harmful is that oftentimes corrupt and immoral journalism just never comes out because there's a very small number of news media organisations available to critique those things. How do these media organisations do that? Firstly, because when you hold multiple media, uh, like multiple newspapers or TV channels across different forms of media, or like a tabloid and a broadsheet, you're able to get more social groups believing the facts that you have decided are the relevant facts about the world, or more, fa or more people believing your ideological opinions. Secondly, because these kind of agendas are much more difficult to regulate. So you get things like the fact that all the regulators on the FCC later expect to go and leave the FCC and work for one of two big media organisations. That means they're much less likely to do things that are damaging to those interests. So you don't get people challenging big corporations. The same thing goes for politicians, because there are no alternative sources for them to appeal to to fight the kind of like bad reporting that might happen about them and their careers. Third reason, journalists and editors have massively weakened career prospects if they ever speak out against things like news corporations, if they ever write a damaging article about them. Why? Because now they own immediately 50% of the like, major newspapers in the United Kingdom will never employ them again. And fourthly, because these groups are able to marshal numerous voters who just like listen to their one newspaper or TV channel behind a particular cause. Why does this policy solve that? No thanks, officer. Firstly, because it just creates more space for the possibility that different kinds of views and different kinds of preferences will be expressed because you don't get these like continuous editorial policies running across different media organisations. Even if you think that some of the opinions expressed on drama will be similar, there is a very least a considerable possibility that on issues that don't directly relate to things like corporate interests, they will express a plurality of different opinions. Moreover, though, because newspapers now have an incentive to seek out different stories in a way that they don't currently, because they need to beat the market, as it were, in order to be the first people to find a story. At the moment, investigative journalism often gets lazy because there are so few organisations actually out there doing that kind of investigative journalism. Also, but we might be willing, perhaps, to concede the bullets going in the middle of have problems, but why do you want to break the BBC and the cooperative of the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune and the San Francisco Chronicle? What are the problems there for you? Uh, 
for exactly the same reasons we've already outlined, that those things represent distinct ideological preferences that we are opposed to having too much play in the media market. We think it's important in general for democracy that we get a wide plurality of views being expressed. Because whatever you think the justification for democracy is, whether or not it's individual autonomy, whether or not it's more people talking about more different things, make better decisions, that requires that many different interests and opinions be in play in the media sector, be being discussed in order to make your democracy function properly. Even the cooperative that runs the New York Times, for instance, or the BBC, will often represent a particular set of social or cultural or ideological interests. Those things are just as damaging. Although we would point out that those organisations like probably in fact are less dominant than things like News Corp. Like Fox News like basically represents an enormously international news organisation which controls like News Corp controls the news media in multiple different countries. Secondly, barriers to entry. Why are they high? Why do they need to be broken down? The first thing is there's very considerable economies of scale in news gathering that makes it very hard for any new entrant into the market to ever get access to that kind of news unless they're given it by a bigger news organisation. So it's very, very expensive. Things like running newsrooms that actually go out and collect information, these organisations are able to apply massive economies of scale and well out of time, and so are able um, to like, do considerable damage to new competitors in that sense. Secondly, there's only multiple different media outlets allows them to reference each other. Often the same kind of kinds of reporting that happen on Fox will also like, be put, like, written about in the Sun or in the Merlin papers. That means that these organisations are able to reference each other, so it makes it very hard for new media organisations to ever get access to that kind of public distance. Finally, though, because like, stuff like new media, right, things like blogs or people tweeting or whatever it is, you think might provide a diverse range of information actually get most of their play to the vast majority of the population when big media choose to pick them up and choose to write about them. That's why we see things like political blogs like 538 and real politics in the US actually getting a vast majority of their play because at some point MSNBC or whoever else it is pick them up and start talking about them on air. That means that ultimately these media corporations are not only able to represent powerful and dangerous interests to democracy, but also able to shut out other people in the market. That's damaging. We propose. I thank the Prime Minister and now invite the Leader of the Opposition to deliver the next speech.
to speak out because no paper wants to employ somebody who tries to prevent newspapers from speaking. That is always going to lead to some, kind, to some degree of regulation capture. The fact that there are a large number of competitors or a small number of competitors makes no difference because nobody wants to employ a whistleblower. No. So, firstly, in terms of the rest of the offer will be interested. So, firstly, in terms of newspapers, note, Mr. Speaker, that there is a single profitable newspaper in the United Kingdom. Every single other one is reliant on cross subsidies by things like TV channels, by things like outside revenues from other newspapers, like, so for example, the Times can only exist because it has things like, because it has the sun essentially subsidising it. What happens when you lose, when you lose policy? Firstly, you lose out on a huge number of newspapers that are incapable of representing other views. The point is, it's true, right, that the Times, that companies like the uh, newspapers like the Times and the Sun do represent a right-wing agenda, but they represent different spectrums along that right-wing agenda, right? There are lots of different ideas that, now, that people are able to engage in. On the their side of the house, you reduce that level of people, that level of di differentiation, because now you only have one populist newspaper that has to stay profitable. In that circumstance, it may be, right, that we do get more right-wing newspapers on our side of the house, but that means that you have more journalists expressing different views along that spectrum that people are able to engage with. Secondly, note that lots of these newspapers still compete, right, because they still have institutional cultures that means that they want to have career progressions and they want to be able to attract readers to their newspaper, right? They want to ensure that they are the ones being read. In that circumstance, you still have competition between newspapers, but they then cross-fund each other in order to make ensure that that journalism happens in the first place. It is not true simply that these newspapers are mouthpieces for Rupert Murdoch. They are still engaged in long-term investigative journalism in order to make sure that lots of things come out that are counter to things like government interests. No thanks. Now, it, these times, it may be true that in media monopolies, you wouldn't get certain newspapers coming out. That's why we're happy to ban those monopolies. In certain cases yeah. where you have more than one newspaper, they are always like they are always likely to be competitors to make sure that controversial stories do come out. You don't get that kind of capture, but you do get newspapers coming out. What's more, they still cross-report on each other, which is why corruption in the corruption in the sun was reported on by the times, right? Even when they are owned by the same person, provided you have effective limitations on editorial control, you have the funds and the ability to be able to, uh, to, be able to go against this. Secondly, in terms of it's also works in terms of raising the barriers to entry. Because note, Mr. Speaker, that private capital is almost never available in order to start a newspaper because these companies are seen as systemically unprofitable and highly risky. In that case, you get one of two things occurring. Firstly, you might get things like microblogs that they want to talk about, but those are far less reliable than the standards of journalism that they are able to present because they do not have the funds to be able to do so. Or secondly, you get reliance on advertising. I'll tell you why that's a problem in a second. First of all, Ben. But the reason private capital never enters is it's effectively impossible for them to challenge the hegemony of like oligopolistic markets. That changes under our model. No, 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 it's not that. It's because not enough people decide to read newspapers, right? Those are dying media, which means either the, which means, well, it means one of three things. Either you don't get any private capital, or you need cross subsidies, or you need to charge progressively more, like things like the New York Times, the Financial Times, putting their putting their um, content behind a pay screen. In that circumstance, you make it such that poor people can never access this journalism in the first place. We think it's a terrible idea to ensure that people can't access any information or any good standard of journalism because you don't get that necessary cross subsidy through populism. But what's more, now you have reliance on advertising, right? You have to, in order to be able to um, fund your newspaper or fund your TV channel, you have to be able to attract big business towards you in order to be able to pay for you to be able to present the standard of content you want. In that circumstance, you have far less accountability than more because every corporation now becomes risk averse to the prospect of upsetting corporations. Firstly, because that corporation may advertise, but secondly, if you have the reputation of somebody who um, goes against corporate interests, nobody wants to try and fund that to ensure that they might be the one who's next. In that circumstance, you have far worse access to information because there is complete capture by elites. You now no longer have a populist newspaper a capable of subsidising other investigative in journalism that's recognised that like, the interest of a media and a media oligarch is not, is not always correlative with the interest of all, uh, all, all elites or all rich people. 
in that circumstance, you break that down. Finally, in terms of cultural projects, note that institutions like the BBC are able to run by, uh, by running things like World Content Online, by selling their content, they're able to run things like the World Service, like BBC4, which are able to engage in the kinds of cultural projects which are easily accessible to individuals in order to widen the scope of their horizons and enable them to better engage with the outside world. You lose that at the point at which there is no ability to subsidise it, or you make it entirely contingent on the taxpayer. These guys hate Silver Berlusconi. The reality is that Berlusconi was able to assert media control because he had complete control of state media and there was nobody there to challenge him. When you don't have the ability to cross subsidise, you lose that ability to make a challenge to the market. Mr. Speaker, it is true it would be better if we all had lots of newspapers that are all cell phone. In the real world, they are not profitable, and so you need to prevent that, you need to prevent capture by elites or capture by big business. I am very happy to oppose. Thank the Leader of the Opposition and now call upon the Deputy Prime Minister to continue the round. Okay, so what we get from Jack is a case that is remarkably unresponsive to ours, but that rather includes a list of different harms, harms that don't, don't take into account the fact that the structure of the market is fundamentally changed by our proposition. After being the first person in this debate to respond, I will bring you two points of substantive. Firstly, I will talk about international interests, having a US or a, like an Australian multinational own the news media across the world may be bad for various people. And secondly, I'm going to take a look at the idea of a false appearance of diversity. Has a spectrum of right wing views of lots of different reasons to support the Iraq war that Jack supports may in fact not be one that is great for democracy. Before that, various points of rebuttal. Um, as regards to the BBC or whoever, just because you like the views that certain media oligopolies put forward, just because the BBC may have very fuzzy and left wing people are, like putting forward a monopoly of views, doesn't mean that ordinary people wouldn't have diversity and a plurality of views to take account. That's the response to the second problem. Second problem so like. Secondly, as regards them being like against monopolies in general and pro regulation, a few things here. Firstly, that doesn't take into account the fact that, as Ben already told you, regulation is harder to do when you allow single, a single organization to own multiple channels, right? Because people want to go into careers in the media and don't want to uh, anger Rupert Murdoch, he tells you, oh, well, people will just dislike whistleblowers in general. The point is, these people aren't whistleblowers. They're regulators who work in regulation. And other news corporations will be very happy with these people if they crack down appropriately on their rivals. No, thank you. Moreover, when you have more than one ideological interest at play, you won't have a knee-jerk reaction against these individuals for, say, not coming down on the side of, like, you know, the Iraq War or George W. Bush or Soviet Rosemary or whatever it is. No, thank you. We don't think other Italian capitalists who might have funded other Italian news organizations would have been angry with someone who stopped Sylvia Berlusconi from, from like, plowing that country into the ground. No, thank you. We think they might have been very happy to employ yeah, them. What are they like? No. They tell you, oh, well, you have a spectrum of different views. We tell you that's an appearance. It isn't, in fact, the case. I'll go into that in my substantive. They tell you, oh, well, you'll have fewer papers under this policy. A few things to say. Firstly, on the point of, like, debating, it's okay for you to say, well, we're in favor of everything, you could, every policy you could possibly implement to improve newspapers. Then it's probably okay for us to say, well, you can subsidize, like, new, new loss-making organizations if you want them to appear. But if you don't buy that response, I have several more. What we tell you about oh, that policy, no, thank you. Um, fundamentally changes the structure of the market, right? Insofar as there's demand for these newspapers, people will still want to put them forward. They give you no reasons for why, one, well, one that newspapers need to be funded by other newspapers as opposed, as opposed to by some other source of capital, which can still happen under our policy. No, thank you. And two, no reason why people fund loss making newspapers in the first place. Presumably, it's some sort of ideological interest. Yes. We don't see why that interest goes away. What we do give you, however, is a plurality of different people funding these loss making newspapers. No, thank you. Uh, no, thank you. And so on. That's good. They tell you, well, they need to rely on ads and, re and rely on like people like going through paywalls and trying like to support themselves. Firstly, these newspapers aren't trying to make a long sentence of the status quo, right? They still need to do a great deal, no thank you, to appeal to advertisers. We think that interest remains in their model as well. Secondly, in order to get advertisers, you need to have people reading your paper. You have to like what they see. And thirdly, what we tell you is that, um, and I'll take you on this in just a second, Thirdly, what we tell you is that at least this way, you're not you're open to one particular set of corporate interests, right? We think it, like a multitude of them is still going to go ahead. 
When, when you say you're okay with subsidies, would that be like you know, the BBC? Yeah, we just don't think the BBC should have multiple channels of views. Um, two points of extension, uh, or of great material, correct. Um, firstly, international, um, international newspapers and, and TV channels. What we tell you here is that there's a particular harm to allowing wealthy investors to take control of national news media across the world, right? We think that if like, Rupert Murdoch didn't exist, there would be various different sources of capital across different countries who wouldn't be able, able to own the, the newspapers and so on that he already owns. Why is it particularly pernicious in a world with like global movement and freedom of capital that individuals can own like a huge multitude of newspapers of um, media interests across the world? Very simply because their interests are likely to be even more divergent from the interests of the people reading the media that they produce, right? In terms of things like economic policy, where it may well be in America's interest to such a certain like protectionist policy be put in place on this industry, not in the interest of people reading like the Mexico Times or whatever, I'll take you in just a second. In situations of foreign policy, where America, like happened in the Iraq War, may be to inject various different countries to commit their troops to a costly and foolish invasion. We think it's a problem then that shareholders and individual owners and um, based in one country set the agenda across the world. Go. At the point at which you're willing to subsidize media, how have you dealt with your form of China's corporate interests in various country and made your own proposition irrelevant by creating one holding corporation to say speaker? no. Um, for various reasons. Firstly, because people are not told you why I disagree with your point, what earth can you have another point? Um, firstly, because like people are very um, very averse to changing what they're watching when they already have a favorite channel, right? People are going to continue to want to get the news from Fox, even if you start up a new even if you start up a new set of the own channel, you need to break the ability of individual people to have a strangle hold on all these spaces um, before you can do that. Secondly, because the amount of capital required is very difficult to compete with when you have one large organization that owns anything, that's a massive problem. So we don't think that this remains the case. And in, like, in any case, even if the subsidies would bring some benefit, the benefits from our, from our policy flow logically from our policy according to our arguments. It's still making the world a better place in either model. So, the false appearance of diversity. What we, what we tell you here is that it is in fact not particularly the case that like, the uh, Fox News and, and The Times and so on give seriously different, um, give seriously different um, points of view on government policy. Rather, they, they are, can be, can, the ownership of various different kinds of media organizations allows the control of those organizations to create the appearance that, time is like the paper, that The Times is like the paper of record which takes into account like a, seri a serious reason argument for something and that Fox News is a completely different organization but with a different editorial team following different policies. We think it's very difficult for individuals consuming media to be sure if, if different media organizations are owned by the same people, because shareholding is often deeply opaque to individuals, individuals who don't know how to do the research and so on, and so they can easily be tricked into thinking that they're getting more than one of you, when in fact it's all going in the same direction. It's true that the Times was eventually forced to report on the scandals within the Sun. It is not true that they went out of their way to report it before someone else revealed it, and it would have looked completely ridiculous for them not to. We think it's a problem that these media organizations are seen to represent different interests when in fact they do not, and that's why we're very proud of the Sun proposition. Thank you.
because it hurts us all, you know, restricts democracy, because there are these huge barriers to entry that stop small players being able to fight. I mean, firstly, you know, by Ben's own standard, that doesn't make any sense, because he said the barrier to entry was economies of scale, which make running a large media outlet cheaper. It doesn't make running a small one any clearer and more cheaper if you get rid of that person. It still makes it really expensive, which just means people won't run newspapers, and suddenly there's no comparative choice here between do I buy, you know, the free newspaper or the more expensive newspaper, it's, oh, shall I just buy Heat magazine instead? Right, but the person, unless you can make other items cheaper, that doesn't go away. But don't worry, you gave us a reason to get rid of that by saying we could subsidise. Note then that once we can subsidise competitors, we have no reason whatsoever to get rid of multiple media organisations. Why would that be? Because now you can fund other people to enter the discourse to challenge them, rather than just to take everybody out of the game and have you just miraculously come up with your own way of this on your own. I want to bring to my business debate the first one will be looking at the actual incentives that the actual motivations that people have on the individual level and the societal level. And secondly, I want to look at the difference, the confusion that these guys make between the free market of ideas and the free market of information. That's how we get on to the second idea then of what happens when you get to would we be any better off. Now, firstly, then, look at this idea of the motivation of people involved. They have two types, right? The first one are people with distinct ideological preferences, to quote Ben, that want to, you know, uh, what do you say, uh, to marginal electorate in their favour. People like Moses Bellasconi, who uh, actually are involved in politics, or people like Murdoch, who can talk to control. The second one, actually, to be fair to them, are more benevolent than that, like BBC, but just by their sheer weight of influence. No, BBC only actually is one corporation, not multiple outlets. Uh, 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 then, you know, passionate people influence the discussions that we have. Also note that still by subsidising other people, we can just put another voice into the discourse. What does he say? These people are involved because, as Jack said, there's only one company that newspaper that makes any money because they have something to push. You haven't made it any cheaper for anyone else to go get in the market, so still the only people involved are people with something to push. It's not going to help me if I still read a newspaper that wants to push an agenda, but it just doesn't have to own some other newspaper because I've never read in the first place anyway. You're not improving the quality of ideas. If the problem is the people behind it want to push an agenda, all you do is you fragment that so that people are still in some kind of false consciousness, whatever you think the dangerous to us. Second is that and um, advertising are in the you know, status quo anyway, so they're just something. No, that's not the problem with advertising. Currently, what you can do is mitigate the losses you are making by putting what's currently in British newspapers, about 50% of them are paid for by PR agencies. Your margin there you can assess by how big a hit can you take. When you take the only people out of the game who are huge multinationals like uh, Murdoch with the wealth, you don't increase the number of those people that can afford to make losses. So actually all you do is decrease or you increase the proportion of advertisers, which means fewer articles get out that give people any information whatsoever. Secondly then, let's look at the idea of this market of ideas and market of information. Because what we see in the social media, which they support, is this has blossomed in the last 10 years, so that every person you meet, either has a Twitter you know, and tweets, limited to 140 characters, or a blog to include uh, more for this sort. What does this do? This allows the thing that they fear most, right? The discussion of what things mean, the encoded means you can put across when the sun can turn up in 1992, say, last one out, turn off the light. People can discuss that idea of whether we're being manipulated, whether we're being changed. Note this idea that Hugh brings out then that when you've got um, people with only one agenda, the kind of false idea of diversity, so you've got the sun and the time, but they do state things differently then. So it's very hard to encode those the same message as people. The people who read the sun and the people who read the time talk to each other and discuss those ideas. They also go on the internet where other people can find it and then go to their workplace and discuss those ideas. All the inherent biases that these guys are worried about are discussed and that is the best way of finding out whether and fighting against those and influencing you that you can have. Note then that to have those discussions it needs to be based on information, which is what Jack tells you when you need investigative journalists that are funded that can spend 12 hours a day looking at this to find out when MPs are taking money from the till, to find out when the phone is being hacked. These are the things that need to be found, and a blogger sits up on his sofa can't do that. A small funded newspaper can't do that. Ben. It's not hard to include vote Labour in your media out there. All you've given is a list of reasons that these organisations are able to send messages to a wide range of different social groups to ultimately believe the same thing.
Oh no, it doesn't make sense, that's fine. Um, the problem with the Ben just said is that newspapers, you know, find it easy to encode, and he has a system that he will get rid of, you know, someone who wants lots of newspapers and find a way to encode them. But still hasn't responded at all to the idea that you can own one huge one and encode lots of people with one big tool, or you have lots of different people encoding you with their ideas that still don't help you at all. What these guys have to do is improve this source of democracy. That's Ben's opening gambit, right? He says he wants this sort of thing to make us think about the policies that affect our lives each and every day, whether we should have redistributed tax, whether we should have immigration into our country. These ideas of effects and benefits should be discussed. Can we do that with less information? No, we can't, because the problem there is you get lots of people discussing but not knowing what they're talking about, which I think most of you find intuitively from sitting through round one to nine, is not very important or get any of understanding moving forward. What you need are people going out there, putting in the time and finding information, finding the facts. He says, look, okay, the time, sorry, he said, the times did report the sun, but they did it reluctantly after a while. And at least the information got out in the first place, but also, firstly, he says it's reluctant, but having more people going out there, having the times, or having state subsidising that you could enter into the market under their own idea, quite their proposition, gets them out. What they have are fewer people, fewer outlets in the game, and they still have all the pernicious harms. We can get, break down monopolies when there's only one person talking, we can break down outrageous biases that take rid of people through regulation. All these people have done is think that a number is important rather than dominance or bias. They do nothing to hurt those harms and we can just subsidise people anyway. <coughs> That's why I'm about to stand in opposition. <laughs>
set these issues themselves. But I actually think because, because often these, when these media roles create lot, and, uh, lots of different outlets, there's incentives to help one outlet to break away, right? So then when all your newspapers are covering one specific issue or larger topic, you may give one newspaper the idea the, the, the to yeah. break out of one specific story, to choose a breakaway story. That is, everyone in the newspaper can generate a dead weight, because everybody could have just there to sell the paper. Or you choose one of your stories to make a breakaway story. But the same time, every other newspaper is still focused on the exact same issue during the time. Yeah. Yeah, but the point is that the Times and the Sun, whilst being cross-subsidised, compete against each other because they have competing institutional cultures to set different right-wing agendas. No. Now you just have one of these no. setting that agenda. No, that's true. Like, they, they, they express different viewpoints by the Times and the Sun, but they still, they still discuss immigration, right? Just different viewpoints on immigration. They still discuss immigration. Yeah. It's still the same thing. It's just the way these viewpoints express on those issues. We're just not going to get back into the people determining issues themselves rather than really about deciding the issues. So there's a the vast incentive that can be used for hedge fees where one island can break away. So you choose break away from one island and other islands and they just continue to have the dead weight newspapers whereby it's still expressing the same issue, not just the break away story. Secondly, there's a massive incentive to determine issues which they do things like win press awards or get or, um, or like get you like certain benefits. Because that means that you choose some issues which are most likely to get these type of things and get these awards and get this type of coverage. We then think you have a massive like, attraction to journalists. Who want to be these massive newspapers and they get the best job that those type of things which have things like press awards because they chose the types of issues that they can best take and take these awards or yeah, best take the types of things that help you. So in that sense, again we recognise those massive incentives to determine the issues which you really about. Then we recognise that there's a greater incentive to narrow the perspective of cross outlets rather than appeal to yeah, opinions. And there's all this really really contains my second point, is the way that you can see the truth in the terms of the media, right? We often recognise that the war type was in necessarily true because often all don't know the fact that one media outlet owns lots of different newspapers, right? It's not, it's not so common knowledge that one man owns lots of different newspaper or TV stations. What does that mean then? It means when one issue is being focused on by all these different types of outlets, the individual gets the impression that that issue is an important one. Why? Because if lots of different outlets are focused on the exact same issue, it's perceived by the individual to be a fact claim which may be pertaining to truth or to yeah, but not the truth, but there's certain in, importance, right? So the way the individual sees lots of different outlets and all the rest of the same thing, yeah, you know, right. one individual is determining the issues that I was discussed, you think then they have no kind of choice of what kind of end media they're actually being exposed to. It's those sort of lots of different like types of media like realizing all contain the exact same issues. What does that mean then? It gives a greater importance to that issue in the individual's mind. Why? Because simple psychology, the individual often like, sees lots of different outlets discussing the same issue, either in the same way or in different ways, but still the same issue at the heart of the debate. And that means the individual sees that as important to me, it's important to everyone else in my society. This
Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, my audience, John. Right, the slogan on your teeth, my teeth, you might be able to see, makes as much sense as the proposal given to you by Oxford and the extremely sensible decision to institute mock finals made by the World's Council yesterday. <laughs> I also want to pay tribute to our speaker for being the first on such proposition to go through their entire speech without conceding the case. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been grateful had you could have spoke somewhat less incredibly quickly as I'm still hungry. I'm going to talk about three things. I don't think that's going to solve going through this now. I'm going to talk about the BBC in more detail, why on its own destroying the BBC is a harm not justified by any of the silly things that we've talked about. We talk about political minorities, how they're shut out. We out vertical integration, horizontal integration. We talk about the race at the bottom and why accentuating uh, the profit motive is really terrible given what things are profitable in this, this industry. First, of all, quick points about it. Firstly, I'm going to reiterate my view on At the point at which you stop subsidising media organisations, everything else in space essentially become relevant because that solves all the problems dealt with by our size. So we're going to presume that that hasn't happened in order to continue having a debate. Because you did then solve all of your problems with challenge and various terms of all of them Right, when you start giving unlimited state funds and funding, and you also, as I pointed out, do you still have one holding company, the state, which is funding everyone, right? So you have just made yourself irrelevant. <laughs> Secondly, right, the reason why it's squirrel is you never told us why there is a difference between news and entertainment channels, such you can tell the pod, and you don't have to meet the word all in the motion, given that all the small channels do cover some news and factual broadcasting. But that is true of everyone, even CBBS, the children's channel for BBC, carries news, right? <laughs> so, congratulations on making yourself a relevant listener. Right. Secondly, uh, going to the extension people we just heard, it's, you said it's okay that we're going to have less funding for investigative journalism. Because those people are really enthusiastic and accept low pay. We don't think that's going to help them when they need to migrate through all the left bins in order to put together Australian newspapers, right, Australian official documents. That requires like 50 people to piece things together. That requires funding. And we also are tremendously excited about the concept of happy amateur John Simpson without his Kevlar jacket, his bodyguards and his interpreters, because those people want work for free and Kevlar is not cheap. You need resources to do investigative and foreign uh, journalism. Right, that's why you need money. We'll come back to that later. Finally, she says the only reason why British newspapers are talking about immigration is because Rupert Murdoch owns them. I would point out that the Daily Mail is not owned by Rupert Murdoch, the Glasgow Herald is not owned by Rupert Murdoch, and the Independent and Guardian are both also not owned by Rupert Murdoch, and all left wing papers. <coughs> I think the reason they about immigration might be because immigration massively affected the British people in the last 10 years, drove down labour wages right, because of mass mobility, which you talked about in like three rounds. Labour mobility might be a real thing that might impact people. That might be the reason why newspapers were talking about it, and not a sinister corporate plot. Sometimes the easy answer is true. Okay. Oh, and finally, there's this terrible harm that people might not know that Rupert Murdoch owns news channels. I think most average kind of slum dwellers could tell you that Rupert Murdoch owns several news channels. But even if that was really a problem, you could just require a carrier logo in the corner of the channel, like the BBC does, like Fox channels do. You just put a big old corporate logo in there, then everyone can see it and they would know. Problem solved. Again, we don't need a problem. Right, first, the BBC. We think it does some things that are pretty important, right? We think the World Service is one of a signal most important human achievements we have at the moment, right? It's just incredibly high quality journalism being put into poor countries for free. That is only able to exist because you have one vertically integrated massive news organisation with multiple outlets, right? It has important things like BBC World Service push to, which is the only non-sectorian broadcaster in Afghanistan. If that had to compete with regular BBC World Service, that would be a massive problem. If it couldn't be cross-subsidised by BBC World Service and CBBS and BBC One and BBC Two and all of the other vastly more profitable channels, it wouldn't exist. 
right? You can also have things like BBC Asian Network, which deals with the problems of South Asians in the United Kingdom and across the world, right? That means that that organisation is funded, because on its own it's not possible. Sir. That's why Dawn TV failed in the UK and the previous uh, launch before that, because it did need cross-subsidies. It also means when something happens in the Asian community, the BBC has a correspondent on hand, which it would not have otherwise, but it couldn't afford to, because that thing is expensive, right? And those minority issues get played. We'll come back to that later. These are things that only exist in large, vertically and horizontally integrated organisations, because they're incredibly expensive and deeply unprofitable. They are not going to exist on their own, except obviously with subsidy and that, as I said before, considered the place. Right. So secondly, oh, actually, I shall take you now. Anyway. Subsidies don't allow you to compete in an ol oligopolistic market for the reasons you gave, self-referencing and incentives for journalists and regulators. They might allow you to stay afloat in a more fragmented one. It's not a concession. No, no, it, it's except that they do, right? That's how they free the standard to go for an enormous amount of the London daily newspaper market as a new entry. Right, because had a massive subsidy from the rest of the Evening Standard Group and could be offered for free. When you can offer media for free, due to massive subsidies, surprisingly people like free things. That's just easy, right? Political minorities, particularly through what I've just said, of political minorities, like the right wing newspapers in the 1980s in the United States, left wing newspapers now. When you have a group of people, your competitors, who for ideological reasons will shut you out, you need integration in order to work. Right? So that's another area where you do need large groups. Also true of Kurdish media groups trying to work in Turkey, because Turkish media groups will frequently exclude them. Unless they can cooperate and cut costs by forming one group, they won't be allowed to survive. And finally, first of all, you to this stuff. When you have to be super profitable, right, you do get more gossip, right? You get more sensationalism, you get more things like phone hacking than purely for profit. Right, you get less foreign bureaus, as we said, you get less niche interests. Like, funny for me, it's just good that the New York Times pick that up. Right, the more people can read that. Because statistical analysis of politics is a good thing, and I'm delighted that more people have heard of it. Right? So you get less good things and more bad things when you adopt the model of government, so obviously they made their own model irrelevant. We beg to oppose. Thank the speaker.
cases, the fact that organisations are super profitable can mean they can afford to be less uh, sensationist because of media habits, some of Rebecca raised extensions, which we get no response to. So, first point about how media corporations have a financial incentive to not just monopolise the market, but monopolise the news agenda by setting issues. We talked about three main things here. Firstly, we talked about how when you have a big corporation that owns lots of media outlets, there is a direct incentive not just to get as many readers as possible, but in that cause, Madam Speaker, to create a media hegemony so that particular individuals can break away from their hegemony. Why is that the case? We told you that media is something which is often very connected to individuals' habits, right? People tend to read the same kind of newspaper, watch the same TV channel a lot of the time. Right? What we think happens when a corporation owns lots of these, no, no thank you, is it's able to do what newspapers need to do in order to drive more readers to them and earn more profits. Namely, have a big story, which means somebody who normally buys the Sunday Times instead goes out and buys the Telegram. I think at the point where media corporations can control the narrative across their multiple outlets, they're much more able to ensure those breakaway, breakaway stories and to like, use their own incentives and own interests to control that agenda. Secondly, in terms of controlling that agenda, they have an incentive to determine issues so that they can do things like win press awards, so that they can do things like get better journalists, so they can do things like increase their profits. And that's especially true if you want to buy the stuff that we're not say about uh, cross funding. Thirdly, we say that there's a greater incentive to narrow the political spectrum across different outlets rather than to appeal, appeal to different opinions. And this matches with the central tenet of opening up, right? Because what they say is that basically when you have like lots of these media corporations, what we're able to do is fund like the left-wing newspaper that's not as popular as the right-wing newspaper, and that's because we get a plurality of opinion in the discourse. We say that's absolutely not what happens under their system. Why? Because it's much better for these companies to narrow the political spectrum and to, spectrum and to move the left closer to right so that the majority of their news coverage is likely to appeal to the biggest number of people. On the second point about all of this, how all of this fundamentally shapes individual opinions. Because first we told you no thank you about media habits, right? The fact that particular people have particularly reliable connections with certain media sources and outlets that they can, that we can depend on and that these corporations can depend on in terms of public stuff, in terms of deciding what to say and what not to say. Secondly, we told you about ignorance, about how people just often don't know about the fact that, that Rupert Murdoch is behind a lot of the issues that are being isolated and identified under the status quo, right? Now, well, to this, we've got a very, very bizarre response. Well, Oscar kind of came up here and said, thanks, Jack. He said, like, um, people can tell you that Rupert, people will probably tell you that Rupert Murdoch owns a lot of newspapers. The point is, probably not which one, so it's all nice to you, but also, like, that's not the point. When he told you about how you can put a logo in the corner, the debate is about people having the choice to have as, as, as impartial and broad a representation of views as possible, right? If you just got lots of corporations all spreading religious messages, but with a healthy logo there to tell you that, that that's what they're doing, that's not a much better situation. Thirdly and finally, though, this goes to the heart of what Rebecca told you in extension. I think simply the existence of these kinds of narratives about these kinds of issues already gives them significance, right? At the point where the Daily Mail is reporting on immigration and on like, Polish immigrants to the United Kingdom, to an extent they have already won, and now that becomes much more of an issue upon which other news outlets report. Then you get the left wing newspapers having to count those opinions and having to present different spins on those stories, but you've still got the issue having been determined by people for all the reasons that we've said, attached to profit motives and being more likely in these big corporations. Uh, Jack. Yeah, the point is you get different views on those issues under our side of the house because you have multiple different holdings that have different journals okay. and right. On yours, you simply have a right wing paper which not yeah. only determines the issues but what people think about those issues. Okay, I'm really going to listen to the same way I talked about how it's actually their interest to change the political spectrum to make it narrow. But let me just engage it a little bit more by using your points about investigative journalism, which is based on the hang hat on, on this issue. Right? We think, firstly, they made it completely, they made it just assertive that investigative journalism does not happen in popular news outlets. I think that's an absolute lie. No, I think actually, no, thank you, I think actually some of the most profitable news organisations are the ones most able to fund this sort of investigative journalism. What we also have on that, Mr. Speaker, is that often like just presenting a popular spin on the issue still requires you to have isolated the issue, right? Um, so we think that's fine. Uh, also, what we say is that actually the kind of investigative, like investigative journalism is the kind of journalism we're most likely to see happening online, right? Which is something that they tried to do on that side of the house by saying that the problem is don't get capital being driven. We think actually investigative journalists are some of the people most driven to get these stories out there, even if it's at their own cost. But we also think that the kind of, like, we just don't accept that the arguments they gave us about high startup costs. Anybody can set up a news outlet online, like blog or something for free, get millions of viewers to it, we don't see that as a problem. 
Lastly, in terms of this stuff about, yeah, about competition and the culture of competition within companies, right? But if at first, it, like, when, when, when Jack comes up and say, well, the Times still reports on the sun's corruption, we say, first, that's a perfect example of a media organization profiting, even from its own sewer, right? Where it's really, really bad. Exactly what we mean about them setting issues to their own self interest. But secondly, we think we're much more likely to get cross scrutiny on our side when there is no shared profit motive at all, or a much less one, right? Because there's comparative in this debate, Madam Speaker, right? Obviously, we accept on this side of the house that individuals are always going to be subject to in influences around them which form their opinions. We think any flourishing democracy must, as much as possible, allow individuals to set the issues at the heart of the new agenda and not a self interested, profit driven media elite. That's why I'm very happy to propose. I thank the speaker and now invite up the opposition whip to close out the round. They mentioned 
Christian pro Sony who control the state media, but the state media knows that you might like, use those subsidies to prevent a certain amount of diversity when it comes to control. But coming to the end of Oscar, you said something important here. No, is you need vertical integration. You need to access different markets. Like if you're the Kurdish media out, like if you're a Kurdish group who wants to get out of Turkey, like you mentioned, and there may not be enough of a market to be just to be profitable selling new no, no thank you, or not enough of a market just to sell a TV channel. But if you can do both, you have access to more profits and a larger market, which means you can compete. No thank you. Why is this important? This is important because it's political and ethnic minorities who other companies don't like, who other news outlets won't share with and work with, and I'll take over in just a second, can actually get into the markets because they have access to this sort of advertising and sorry, access to the sort of white markets that they can do. Yeah. You can keep a soft take with how big it's diversity, but why do the editorial stop even the time to do a soft take when there's the central ideological and class interests of the people that own them, which was our case? Okay, you don't have to argue like the sign of time to represent completely different groups. That's never been the opposition line. But if you want certain groups will drop out of the market entirely, no thank you like the one left doing newspaper, no thank you just small if it can't integrate with the left wing TV station and share markets, or the Kurdish one which can integrate vertically. We think that's the problem. Like you don't necessarily change that, but you drop the other ones out entirely. That's the question. So. No, like why is all this true? Because you don't have to be big to survive, right? Investigative journalism is really expensive for everything on social media. If you have less investigative journalism, you have less of the criticism of media companies being by each other. No, thank you. You have less foreign respondents. And also, in terms of like raising the issues, also, like, this is sort of like, I know there's another response to their extension. We think minority and ethnic and minority interests, political groups, are incredibly important when it comes to right. like, raising issues than it is just raising viewpoints, right? If every Turkish majority newspaper ignores Kurdish language issues in your country, you would want to have one of the people that represent the Kurds to get that issue out there, not just that viewpoint. But like, we say also like the fact that BBC can now afford to have dedicated reporters is expensive. No, thank you. It's bad to refer to all those things. Okay, so next we just told the final idea is like the problem is that like this sets the agenda for blogs. Okay, right. Why should the Murdoch papers, through their monopoly, be allowed to make something an issue that the Guardian has them to report on instead of individual members of the Democratic election? Well, we don't need to bad thing that we have to talk about what each other said. The point is the Guardian exists on this side, and we simply make Murdoch report on the Guardian's issues because they're both out there and you can't look like a fool and not report on what other media corporations are reporting. You lose that on this side, but you lose the ability of minorities to more effectively insert their issues into the market. But secondly, on the quality of journalists. Because like, we think what Oscar told you here is important about the race to the bottom, right? If suddenly as a corporation, like as a newspaper, for example, you're not make, it's much more important if you make a profit because you can't be cross-subsidized by a TV station that makes a bunch of money, this means you have to go for what sells the most copies, right? This means you have got to go for the celebrity. This means you've got to do things like phone hacking and anything that will give you an edge. We think that profit only just massively damages the quality of journalism, which goes out and informs people. Like, in terms of also just setting issues, we think it's very odd that the proposition has given us a model which seems to think entertainment channels don't set issues, right? The fact that, you know, what happens in popular news doesn't affect how people perceive the important issues in their nation's view. We think they're still missing out on that, and they haven't fixed that. And like, again, it's significant to the quality of journalism. So, like, Mr. Speaker, we told you all the reasons this doesn't lead to what the proposition wants and leads to a much worse world. And for all these reasons, we are very proud to oppose.